I'm uh, um, Manish Jain. I live in uh, the magical land of Rajasthan in India, and I am involved in uh, many things, reimagining education, unlearning, uh, reclaiming the gift culture, connecting to indigenous knowledge systems, um, and uh, work on a project called Swaraj University locally, and also this global network called the Ecoversities Alliance. I feel that uh, localization is um, one of the important, most important movements in the world, and that uh, this uh, shifting of power is one of the things that we fundamentally have to do. And so my work has been around shifting power that has how we see knowledge, how we see ourselves, our relationships to land, to community, to, to ancestors. Um, and uh, so I think this place, this movement and this gathering is really uh, a place where people who are um, not only concerned about the world and what's happening, but are really creating the kind of futures that we want to see um, that are much more rooted, which much more give much more happiness and joy. One thing that I have particularly uh, gave up on a long time ago is this idea that we can fix the system. So the design is inherently bad for people and the planet. And so we may have to find places where we can work with people in the system, but this, this metaphor of us going and fixing it and all of that, I think so it can be, we can escape it, we can dismantle it, we can create, connect to other systems, start seeing them again. There's many, many, actually, the planet is not being sustained by this dominant system. It's actually all of the microsystems that exist around the planet, which is sustaining life still. So how do we connect to those places, strengthen them, deepen them, um, help reclaim them? And uh, uh, I think that's where I see some hope. And what's interesting as we start to do this, like um, there, there's, uh, there, are very, there are some very good people who still work in the dominant system. And uh, when we can connect to them, when they start to connect, like food, food is a fantastic way to connect with people. And uh, so right now we do a lot of millet festivals, for example, in, in the, all kinds of people from the dominant system come to. And when we start to see that there's a space of building trust again, so I, I talk a lot about this these days, is if we can build trust, those people even are willing to support things that are happening around. So one of the things is how do we move resources from that dominant system into supporting all of these little, you know, microsystems and uh, and growing those and nurturing those. So that's giving me a lot of hope. Uh, obviously, we're in a race against time in some sense because of the scale of things and magnitude. So many people are being um, pushed out of the system. Um, I think is a great hopeful thing because they are, whether they're in villages or favelas or bastis in India, or they're creating actually beautiful things. There's a term, jugar, uh, which is, you know, playful improvisation. They're in a very deep jugar process of creating those new systems, the seeds of that. And I think if we support those kinds of initiatives, connect to those, um, it starts to point a, to us at least there's a different direction that is possible um, and then those invitations for people you know those individuals who, who who are still searching because that system the good thing is that system takes makes you feel empty so every single person who basically is working in that system feels empty and so if we can touch into that there's a space where thing and then i think we need to know um, what the ask is you know what's the invitation to them that's where a lot of work from our side I've been learning into that is how do we invite them into uh, reimagining uh, life. We use this distinction, de deadly hoods versus a livelihoods. And the idea is that most of the work that we have been trained for by the modern school and university is actually work that is destroying the planet. Uh, and it starts with destroying our, 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 our spirit, our souls. Our, we use the term soul sucking jobs, which which is very common, and uh, and also destroying a sense of community uh, relationships, uh, and really focusing on you know this this highly egotistical 
competitive individual in creating that. And it's also destroying our ecosystems through extraction industries and all of that. So that's becoming more and more visible to everybody on the planet. Um, and <clears throat> most of the time, what, uh, what we've been taught in the mainstream universities is, don't worry about all that, just think about the package. So that if you actually see most conversations of young people who are graduating, they're, they're, the dominant narrative would like you just to talk about the package, and that's your own self-worth, sense of purpose, meaning gets tied to that. But if we can start to uh, disentangle that, um, then we have a space for what we call a livelihood. So this is the work that is making I guess, us start to feel alive about who we are, how we're connected, uh, start to make our communities feel alive, the trust, the kindness, compassion, social bonds that we all crave, and the work that can make our ecosystems come alive, rather than green jobs within the corporations. One thing we talk a lot about is what is real wealth. So the real wealth is our health and our relationships and our you know, uh, um, vibrant ecosystems and all of that. It's not just the money that we have in the bank account or the package. How do we build real wealth? Shifting people from this fear and scarcity that this toxic culture keeps um, uh, promoting for good consumerism um, into a sense of abundance. It gives people a different position to start to think differently about their future and the choices, the decisions that they want to make. We need to um, think about how do we bring things to right scale. Uh, so part of the problem is the, the enormous scale, which we have no idea of how things operate in that. But bringing things down to right scale, and, and we can scale in a sense of cross that there can be thousands, hundreds of thousands of small initiatives which are connecting, and they have to be very localized and very contextualized. So part of when you scale up is you, you end up getting into the monoculture trap. And so if we start to think of lots of things, so we're saying that there can be thousands of ecoversities all over the planet and they're already existing. It's a question of them actually deepening themselves rather than scaling themselves and, uh, and, uh, and developing again a different confidence around who they are and what they're, how important they are in terms of helping us connect to ourselves in place again. The whole scaling up discourse is used to discredit very important initiatives, people who are doing really small things, but things that are meaningful for their places and communities, to discredit them and saying, oh, this is not enough. So not, and to continuous make us feel, to, to make us continuously feel like we're not enough and, and uh, we need to, everyone has to be on the latest app and everyone has to be uh, doing something at an at a inhuman scale or a, a natural scale to feel worthy about ourselves. So there's a huge politics that's involved in it, which is around disempowering and disarming people. Uh, and we can start to reclaim a dis different discourse, I think it's important as part of the localization. I think this idea that um, the so-called poor nations have to keep growing, and that's their, their, uh, almost a moral imperative, I think we need to question it. Um, because the economic, if we look now over the last 50 years or 100 years, who has this economic growth really benefited, right? It's the global corporations, it's the billionaires. Like it, in a place like India, you sh I'm shocked to see how many billionaires are there. You know, like you, this, the, the, the divide is growing. So we're talking about economic growth, but it's all being channeled upwards. And if we look at the, um, the design of the systems, they're all designed the game is all designed to keep channeling that, that wealth up. So when I was a banker, investment banker, we were all fed the trickle-down economics. And I think the reality is that it's actually designed to gush up, not trickle down. And so we need to really come to the, the facts actually speak for themselves of who's benefiting. And then what's even more crazy is um, the development models that we've chosen feed into the same game. And so actually, the, what actually ends up in terms of going to communities from the global development agencies and what actually goes out of communities, it's like insanely mind-boggling and disgusting 
actually how much wealth is being still taken out from local communities, local ecosystems in the name of development and progress. So I think we need to really look uh, look more more in detail and uh, and uh, it's not to say that you know um, uh, growth is not needed, but it's a very different kind of growth. It's what I'm saying: regenerating the real wealth of communities. Is that really growing? I think that's what we need a whole whole different set of indicators. And actually, the other thing is you know like we're still using these archaic you know, almost, and deceptive things like G, GDP, GNP, uh, and we look about growth without talking about all the costs to that growth. So when we start bringing all of these conversations in the next, the picture becomes very different. You start to actually factor in um, soil degre degre degradation, forest degradation, water degradation, air quality degradation, uh, human relationships degradation, then we're like, it's very obvious that we are in a huge negative growth paradigm. Like, it's not real growth happening, you know. You cannot just, you know, in, you know, Mike, I'm originally from a business community. You cannot destroy all your real assets, the foundation, and call it growth. Well, we're doing is extracting and mining and calling it growth, and that doesn't really add up. The dominant education system is designed to destroy our connection to self and to place and to community. And I think that uh, that's why, you know, a lot of friends in our movement are trying to add little things onto it, um, you know, like a yoga class or a little farm class. And these are all beautiful things. But I don't think that really gives people um, the confidence to actually walk on these paths. What needs to be done, and, and this is why we're like actually totally redesigning the learning spaces and arguing for them, is like you need to have space to practice. You need to be able to do farming. You need to fall in love with farming. And it's maybe if you're lucky, a one hour workshop or a one day a week might help you. But most of the time I've not seen it, really people saying, oh, I really want to become a farmer because of that one thing. But if you get to do it every day, and you start to make friends around that and build community around that and, and be respected for that, then you think, oh, maybe this is a career. And I've had actually a lot of young people through some of our urban farming projects really start to you know, find that passion, but they were able to do it every day and, and really you know, have the space to fall in love with that. And so I think that you know, what at least I feel is we need to create these, these proper spaces where people can um, have the time to go th into things deeply because otherwise you're bombarded all the time. Luckily, there is an opening of a discourse where people are thinking about, you know, what gives me happiness, what gives me, what's good for the planet. So this is creeping into even the mainstream circles and people are making different decisions, but it's not enough as we know. And so I think that we need to reclaim and build new spaces for our own knowledge production, which says our grandmothers are important. I was unfortunately taught that I'm edu educated and my, my illiterate village grandmother is uneducated. And it was a tremendous uh, you know, um, process and journey for me to recover you know, that, uh, and, and understand that she is actually probably more intelligent than my Harvard professors and uh, is able to really help connect me back to the things that really matter in life which we've been promoting is a gap year idea. And that is incredibly, um, it looks very innocent. And, but for many, many friends, I've seen a gap year to be able to travel around and connect to many localization initiatives and many different kinds of communities that has a tremendous impact. And so, you know, if we can at least get people out of schools and universities uh, for a year, uh, it can it can at least start to you know then life and it's all of its magic and its big questions and 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 real teachings that it gives us can actually have a chance to to help us move shift directions. The damage of this um, the education models that we uh, have spread all over the planet. Um, comes actually not even so much from the content 
So it's not, there's a saying, you know, the white teacher who brought the pencil also brought the eraser. And so what's being erased? Um, so we're told, as I said, our grandparents don't exist anymore. We're told that our territories, our lands don't matter. We're told that our hands and our bodies don't matter. We're told that our ancestors don't matter. And as soon as, and, and there, all of those things are being erased, but if you just go a little bit under the surface again, they're all still alive. Uh, and I think that if we, we uh, reimagine education, we start to see we still have a lot of, of wealth, real wealth is still existing in us. And I think that's what the localization movement is trying to remind us of, is we're not poor, backwards, stupid, alone, like the dominant system would like us to think we are. We still have a lot of power. And if we can create systems which, which help us understand that, help us connect to that, uh, we can start to define a different game. I think this is where, you know, our own education systems, if we start to build them, um, they can help us see that uh, there's many other ways to understand life and understand who we are and why we've come to this earth together and what is our sacred covenant with, with the rest of uh, nature. And I think that that can actually then start to build a different model. Again, those models exist, they're, they're still existing, but how do they interface and negotiate and, and dismantle the existing dominant system? I think that's the big question of our times. The fundamental thing is to, as many of my elders have said, is to remember. The first step is to remember uh, really who we are and what we have and what we've come to this earth for. And then things can start to flow in the right direction from that.